Well, good evening, um, everybody, and um, it gives me pleasure to give the fourth in a series of lectures uh, sponsored by the college um, celebrating the 300th anniversary of the death of Sir Christopher Wren. Uh, we've already had Wren on the cosmos, we've had Wren on maths, we've had Wren on medicine, and tonight we have Wren on, not on architecture, but sort of on architecture. We have him as a courtier. On the 28th of October, 1642, at the head of 12 companies of foot soldiers, the parliamentarian colonel, uh, John Venn, entered the gates of Windsor Castle that you see here. Securing this mighty fortress was, of course, a military objective, but equally important for the parliamentarians was its symbolism. King Charles I had made St. George's Chapel a model of the sort of religion that he wanted for the Church of England. Ceremonious, dignified, and richly furnished, the chapel, the interior of which you see here, uh, and the uh, liturgy uh, performed within it was uh, an abomination to the godly parliamentarians who opposed the king and his policies. Well, the Dean of Windsor, expecting trouble, had ordered the exquisite stained glass window in the chapel's west end, containing images of no fewer than 25 popes, to be taken out and hidden. As the Dean was also ex officio register of the Order of the Garter, he hid beneath the floorboards of the college treasury a diamond-studded George uh, which is a, a badge of the Order of the Garter, perhaps the most valuable one ever made. And then the priceless registers of the Order in three great volumes, dating back to Henry VIII's reign, were also hidden. Well, Colonel Venn's arrival at Windsor had not only been anticipated by the Dean, because five days before his entry, the castle had been overrun by a band of local gentry sympathetic to Parliament. Fearing a, a royalist takeover of the fortress before Venn could get there and secure it, they had taken the law into their own hands. Demanding the keys of the college treasury from the dean, who refused them, they brought in giant crowbars to break into the vault. Inside were beautifully fashioned silver gilt basins, candlesticks and flagons, which were carried away, sent to London, and melted down for coin. And it was just this sort of disorder that the House of Lords, which was still sitting at this point, wanted to avoid. And it instructed Colonel Venn to protect the fabric and the ornaments of the college from defacement. But Venn was a political radical and a religious zealot, and had absolutely no intention of allowing the popish ornaments of Windsor to remain. So the stained glass windows were smashed, the woodwork was torn down, the organ demolished, the lectern fonts and statues torn out, and King Edward IV's coat of chain mail and his surcoat embroidered with pearls and rubies was carted away and sold. Well, Colonel Venn was now in charge of the castle, and not wanting to use the royal apartments, which... Okay, so the royal apartments are up here in this big block. Um, he decided instead to live in the deanery. So there's the chapel that I've been talking about. And at the end of the chapel, you can see um, a little courtyard. And um, to move it on there, the deanery is this, the, the, the building um, uh, just below 12 on, on the left there. This um, capacious lodging had been completed in 13. 52 as a relatively modest re uh, residence for the head of St. George's College. But by the early 17th century, it had been enlarged and beautified, and it was now a substantial house. Here, for the next three years, then provided, uh, presided over the Windsor garrison. And the dean, Christopher Wren, was expelled. 
Now, Sir Christopher Wren, as I shall call the architect, was born in 1632, and he spent some of his childhood in the Windsor Deanery, while his father, who was also called Christopher, confusingly, as his son was, um, was the dean. Uh, he was educated there at uh, Windsor and also at his father's uh, country rectory. Um, and during the Civil War, for a very short period, he was at Westminster School. And at Windsor, he would have become familiar with the ceremony and the grandeur of Charles I's court, and he certainly would have met the Prince of Wales, uh, his future patron, who was just two years older than him. Sir Christopher's pedigree was just about as courtly as it could be. His father, uh, Christopher, and his uncle, Matthew, who you see here from uh, the pages of Parentalia, the, the, the biography of Sir Christopher written by his son, uh, they, these men were both major ecclesiastical figures at court. They were close to the king, both in proximity and in ideology. Matthew Wren, uh, his uncle, Dean of the Chapel Royal and Bishop of Ely, ended up spending 18 years locked up in the Tower of London for his views. His brother, Christopher, simply lost his post at Windsor and retreated into rural obscurity. Luckily for Sir Christopher, his father was not financially ruined like so many dispossessed royalists. His mother was a co-heiress to a great merchant fortune, and this enabled uh, him to fund his son's education and indeed broker excellent marriages for three of his daughters. All three married fervent royalists, as perhaps might be expected. Yet, despite this undoubtedly privileged upbringing uh, at court, it was not the ceremoniousness of Charles I's court that was to be the greatest influence in his childhood. His father, Dean Wren, was not only a courtier and a divine, he owned a library of scientific books and was fascinated by botany, climatology, mathematics, and, of course, architecture. And he took great care over Christopher Jr.'s education and, in particular, uh, encouraged his uh, um, um, study of mathematics. Mathematics uh, was to become the foundation of Sir Christopher's world picture, the means by which the universe and all its moving parts could be explained. For him, the world was a machine, and it was possible using the tools of geometry and arithmetic to unravel its workings. And this was immensely exciting. Old scientific explanations derived essentially from Greek and Roman philosophers uh, had little interest for Wren, and he uh, very rarely, if ever, read their disputations from an early age, turning his inventive mind to solving practical problems with new ideas. And he fell into the two great centers of new scientific thought, a group of brilliant men at Wadham College, Oxford, and, of course, our own Gresham College. And here they talked, they argued, they experimented, and they calculated, and Sir Christopher amongst the most brilliant of all of them. First, he became Gresham Professor of Astronomy, age 25, and then before he was 30, uh, Civilian Professor of Astronomy at Oxford. Now, we have to remember that these extraordinary achievements for such a young man took place during the English Republic. And at the Restoration, out of Wadham and the Gresham College group came the Royal Society, the oldest scientific academy in continuous existence. And through that came Sir Christopher Wren's introduction to King Charles II. Now, King Charles 
used to, the second, I should say. We have to get used to the fact that there's a third. King Charles used to be char characterized as the Merry Monarch, a man wholly given to pleasure and debauchery. But this really couldn't be further from the truth. We now know that he shared the sense of excitement and possibilities of the new science and had a huge curiosity for astronomy, chemistry, physics, and geometry. At Whitehall, adjacent to his most private quarters, was an extensive laboratory where he went to conduct his own experiments. So when Sir Christopher re-emerged in Charles II's life, not as a 10-year-old son of a courtier, but as a mathematical genius, he was attracted to him immediately. Unquestionably, because of his family, but more importantly, because of his brains. But let's not overdo the intellectual king bit. Because Charles, as we know, loved a joke, loved good company, loved a drink, loved a laugh, and a good night out. And while it would have been possible to have captured the king's attention through scientific achievement alone, it would not have been possible for Sir Christopher to win the king's trust, friendship, and high honors unless he had been extremely good company. Not only was late 17th century government personal, directed by the monarch himself, but to be the king's architect was to be admitted into the innermost royal circle. Not only to know the workings of the state rooms, but to understand the secrets of the bedchamber. And as I shall go on to explain, Wren was extremely good company. In fact, he was the perfect courtier. When in um, 1669, Christopher Wren became the head of the Office of Works, the Royal uh, Architecture Department, he inherited command of an organization nearly 300 years old. The Office of Works had, in fact, been established by King Richard II in 1379, not only to uh, repair and maintain the royal building stock, but to project manage new buildings. The surveyor of the king's works was a member of the king's household, and although he theoretically uh, reported to the Lord Chamberlain, in practice it was to the Lord Treasurer who Wren looked. In 1662, the surveyor required treasury authorization for anything more than routine maintenance. And even this was capped at 40 pounds a year for the larger palaces and 20 pounds a year for the smaller ones. And given the fact that almost every year Wren spent considerably more than that, he took his orders from the treasurer. In fact, the Office of Works should really be categorized as a separate department of state because its money came direct from the exchequer rather than being wired through the household and the Lord Chamberlain. And if you look at it in this light, Sir Christopher Wren was essentially one of the great ministers of state on a par rather than answering to the Lord Chamberlain. In a period when the monarch was the head of the executive, Whitehall, the principal palace of the British monarchy, was not only the king's main residence, but it was the center of national administration. There's no real modern equivalent that satisfactorily characterizes Restoration Whitehall. Huge, confusing, overpopulated, in equal measure, squalid and magnificent, it was both residents and an office block housing courtiers and bureaucrats. And it was the center of the world for anybody who was anybody. On assuming his senior post in 1669, Whitehall became the center 
of Wren's life. And the lodgings he was assigned there became the engine room of his career. You see, as well as the royal family, Whitehall was home to an army of over 800 domestic staff and perhaps 300 others who could broadly be characterized as being courtiers. Some of these, like Sir Christopher Wren, were granted lodgings because of their household, political, or administrative appointments. But for the majority of courtiers, angling for lodgings was a feature of life. Everyone wanted spacious lodgings as close as possible to the king, and very few got them. Though the palace in the 1670s had around 1,500 rooms, there was always cutthroat competition for even the smallest cellar or attic. Because most people held their lodgings by royal warrant for life, there were long waits for the best lodgings, even for important people. And policing the huge number of residents was complicated by the fact that some parts of a lodging's fabric were regarded as the responsibility of the Office of Works, while other elements could be altered with permission and at their expense by the occupants. In reality, it was very difficult to persuade the Office of Works to pay for doing works in a private individual's quarters. And so, financial responsibility normally fell to the occupant. For this reason, the lodgings of the most important courtiers were essentially privately funded residences. The fact that lodgings were built at their occupant's expense gave them considerable rights. And as the reign advanced, lodgings were increasingly held by courtiers under a lease rather than by a warrant from the monarch. Now, the um, Office of Works and Sir Christopher's lodgings were situated in Scotland Yard. Uh, this uh, was the area of land that lay between the northern part of Whitehall. Now, I hope you can see this. Um, so just above where it says the river, is the Privy Garden. Uh, it says Garden Stairs. Above that are the main lodgings, the main royal lodgings. And you then see Privy Stairs. Uh, beyond there, you can see uh, the, the kitchens. Uh, then it says Whitehall Bridge. And there are a whole lot of sort of raggedy bits and a bit saying Scotland. Do you see that there? So that's Scotland Yard, lying between the north boundary of Whitehall uh, and Charing Cross and the great um, houses of the aristocrats, um, which were... Um, built along the Strand. Um, we can get a much better sense of this area if we look at the very well-known uh, copper plate map. Um, and once again, you can see the Privy Garden. Can you see, see where it says Privy Bridge? That is the uh, residential part for the monarch. But above that, you can see um, some yards. Um, and right at the top hand, uh, left-hand corner, uh, a, a conglomeration of buildings which um, in the Elizabethan period were already um, being occupied by the Office of Works um, in that part of Scotland Yard. Well, in the first year of uh, King James I's reign, um, Simon Basil, who was then controller of works under Queen Elizabeth, built a house in the northernmost section of Scotland Yard. Um, it wasn't particularly big. It had a hall and a parlour, that's a sort of ground floor reception room and a kitchen, and it had three rooms above it and a backyard. But after Basil became surveyor of works in 1606, uh, he was granted a 60-year lease on his house and on the land around it. So uh, he decided to uh, uh, build some houses on the land which he rented for his um, own uh, profit. Well, after he died in September 15, uh, his widow leased this house to his successor, Inigo Jones. And at the start of the Civil War, uh, Inigo Jones was still living in a house which, if the pointer worked, uh, which it does... Oh, 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 how exciting. Oh! <laughs> Uh, that is very exciting. I can show you exactly where Inigo Jones lived. Uh, he lived just here. Um, 
and um, uh, that is where he lived when he uh, lost his positions under the, um, under the Commonwealth. But by 1660, when the crown um, uh, was uh, restored, Inigo Jones's house had passed into private hands, and it wasn't uh, available for the um, Surveyor of Works. The Surveyor of Works in 1660 was a man called Sir John Denham. Uh, he was a loyal royalist who'd been at Charles I's side uh, when he was in prison at Hampton Court, uh, when he was locked up on the Isle of Wight, um, and then he'd uh, gone into exile and been at the court of Henrietta Maria in France. With most of his lands sequestered, by 1648, he was in the entourage of Prince Charles at The Hague, where he acted as a, as a messenger between the Prince of Wales um, and his mother, who was in Paris. With no money to reward Denham's services, the king promised him that on the restoration, uh, he would succeed Inigo Jones as a surveyor of works. At the time, it probably seemed like a pretty hollow promise. But in 1660, amazingly for Charles II, he kept his word. The restored office of works was established on exactly the same basis as it had been before the Civil War. Denim, uh, at its head, was leased a plot of land in Scotland Yard on which he could uh, build. And uh, just like um, Simon Basil, he built um, a row, a terrace of houses, in fact, that he let out for his uh, own income and a house for himself. And it was this house, built for Sir John Denham, that became the surveyor's residence and which Sir Christopher Wren inherited as his official Whitehall uh, lodgings in 1669. Now, very luckily, one of the very first tasks assigned to Christopher Wren as surveyor of the king's works was making an accurate survey of Whitehall Palace in preparation for the king's great plan to knock everything down and rebuild it. This survey, completed in 1670, shows uh, in detail the whole of Scotland Yard. Now, I'm going to use the magic pointer again. Um, and you can see there, there um, Scotland Yard. It's actually divided into two parts. Um, down by the river here, uh, there was Scotland Dock, where all the building materials for um, the Royal Works were uh, unloaded on barges. Um, there were a series of uh, warehouses and sheds here and all the way up here, in which timber, glass, lead, stone, bricks were all kept. Um, and on this, uh, this run of buildings up here uh, were the masters of the works. So you had the master carpenter, uh, the master mason, uh, the king's glazier, the king's locksmith, the king's painter. They all had little houses there, which also doubled as their offices. And uh, at the top here, you can see this building, which is the terrace of houses built by Sir John Denham, which didn't pass to Wren uh, and remained the possession of uh, Denham's widow. But crucially, here, the house which was built by Denham for himself as surveyor of the works and is the house that Sir Christopher Wren uh, moved into uh, when he got the big job. Now, this house was Sir Christopher Wren's main residence between 1669 and his loss of office in 1718, a period of 50 years. He had no other home, no city mansion, no country seat. Under William and Mary, he was given um, an official residence at Hampton Court because he was doing so much work there. And he was given another, uh, sort of, almost really a sort of cottage at Kensington. But Wren lived the whole of his architectural career in Whitehall Palace, in this uh, house, just a stone's throw from the royal apartments. Now, after Sir Christopher's death, this house in Scotland Yard was found to be 
in extremely poor condition. And it was surveyed in order to decide whether to rebuild it or to refurbish it. And the plan survives. And I believe this has never been identified before. What you are looking at is uh, the house in which Sir Christopher Wren lived for 50 years. And you will see that um, the walls are covered uh, in three colours. Uh, you can ignore the, um, the, the yellow, because that represents um, another building uh, to, the, uh, to, to one side. Um, the grey are the offices of the Office of Works. So that is where the clerks, um, uh, his assistants, uh, had their offices every day. That's where they worked, their working place. They came in off uh, Scotland Yard here. They came in up a staircase there um, into the upper rooms, and there were three rooms, uh, three offices uh, downstairs. And you can see that it's co uh, colored a different color because that means that it was the responsibility of the Office of Works to maintain those uh, rooms. The rest of it, the grey bit, is Sir Christopher Wren's private residence, which um, he was responsible for maintaining um, himself. And on the ground floor uh, was uh, his... So I can get this here. His hall, um, his kitchen. Uh, he had a, a lovely garden here at the top. I'll switch this off in a minute so you can see. Um, there's a little yard here. It had cellars um, and um, various other uh, sort of ancillary um, uh, buildings. There was a stair that led up to the first floor. And although we don't have a plan of the first floor, we do have the building accounts. And we know that he had a great dining room, a smaller private dining room, a drawing room, a dressing room, and a bedroom. And we know that his bedroom had been set up with a fashionable bed alcove by Sir John Denham. Um, and in this, the surveyor's uh, uh, bed was placed. There was a floor above for his servants, uh, which probably also contained the nursery for his children. Uh, as I've shown you, there were cellars full of wine, two yards and a long walled garden, which uh, in 1669 he um, set up with a garden seat surmounted with a pediment. Perhaps slightly further away from the royal apartments than some uh, courtier lodgings, Wren's house was in fact amongst the largest and best appointed of all the houses allocated to any of the senior courtiers. And here in this house, he lived happily with his first wife, Faith, and it was in that house that she died of smallpox in 1675. Two children were born to her, including Christopher the Younger, who survived his father. And in 1677, Wren married his second wife, James, Jane Fitzwilliam, in the Chapel Royal at Whitehall. She uh, was already pregnant, which shows that Wren was not without an active libido. Uh, after giving birth to a daughter, she also died in 1680. And so, in the 1680s, we have to imagine this house in Scotland Yard with three young children running around in it. And the fascinating thing is that we know from the building accounts that at first floor level, there was an interconnecting door from Wren's drawing room into the Office of Works. And I think we have to imagine these three small children opening the door, peeping in, seeing the clerks there um, uh, enrolling the accounts and drawing their plans. Wren's daughter never married, and she lived at home in this house with her father. And his young, younger son, William, who was mentally handicapped, also lived at home. And the only one of his children who moved out was uh, Christopher Jr., uh, who moved to a house in St. James's that his father had uh, bought for him. So this is the environment in which Wren lived for 50 years, hugger-mugger with his family in the centre of Whitehall, a stone's throw away from the king. Now, his official remuneration 
as surveyor was 382 pounds, five shillings and eight pence a year. And his salary was actually made up of three allowances. The first one was paid by the exchequer, and it was a daily fee of two shillings and, uh, a, a day, plus sixpence, uh, which was an allowance to employ a clerk. And that was a total of £45, 12 shillings and sixpence a year. Uh, the second part of his salary was a sort of historical legacy, because the surveyor used to be one of the household officers who used to wear a uniform. And when the uniforms were abolished, or the livery was abolished, um, the fee for buying the outfit was still paid to the office holder, and Wren got £12, 13 shillings and fourpence a year in lieu of his uniform. The third stream of income, um, which was actually issued by the paymaster of the Office of Works, was a big bundle of allowances and compensations, and that actually made up the bulk of his salary. Now, £380 a year was not enough to sustain Wren as a gentleman, and it was way beneath the salaries and allowances of the more senior household officials. Just to give you an example, the master of the robes, who looked after the king's personal wardrobe, was paid £500 a year and required no technical knowledge and very little special skill. And in fact, in later life, Wren was to remark to his son Christopher that Charles II had done him a big disservice, enticing him into architecture, and if he'd stuck to medicine, he would have become a rich man. Well, this was perhaps a bit disingenuous, because in addition to his salary from the Office of Works, Wren received fees for his work rebuilding the churches in the city of London, which had been destroyed by the Great Fire. So that was £100 a year. And of course, in addition, were the fees paid to him uh, as the architect for St Paul's Cathedral, another £200 a year. And later on, he was also paid for his work for the Royal Hospital in Greenwich, several private commissions at Cambridge University, and some work for individual courtiers. And so actually, his total earnings in the 1690s cannot have been much less than £800 a year. In fact, so confident was he of his financial position by that stage that he magnanimously waived his fee for the design of the Royal Hospital uh, in Chelsea. So in reality, Wren was able to cut quite a dash at court. He maintained a carriage with liveried coachmen and a stable full of horses in Scotland Yard. He had several servants, including a footman who was normally in attendance with him. He dressed in the fashions of the day. Here's the lovely picture in the National Portrait Gallery, which you'll be able to see next week when the gallery reopens. Um, he entertained liberally, and he furnished his house fashionably. He commissioned portraits of his wife. He bought furniture, kept up with interior design fashions. When he moved in to his house in 1670, the sergeant painter redecorated more or less the whole house. And for his second marriage, he ordered the redecoration of his bedchamber. The old frieze and what was described in the accounts as bed mold of 1661 was taken down, and 50 foot of new bed mold was erected in its stead. The door to the dressing room next door was moved, and a, a room nearby was petitioned. In 1676, a custom-made drawing table was installed in his house, not in the office next door, but in his private quarters. And a couple of years later, his private closet was enlarged. The house, we know, was decorated with a large number of prints, including many uh, prints of his own buildings, but also prints of paintings, interiors, classical busts and statues. One room, perhaps his closet, we don't know, contained bookshelves containing some 600 volumes. Larger cabinets, perhaps in the same room, contained some 900 drawings, and there was a cabinet with antique gems and medals. <clears throat> 
So let's be very clear. Wren lived in style <clears throat> and luxury with his family at court in a large house attached to his office. And I'm showing you this view again, um, which is the view by Kip taken um, after the um, catastrophic fire at Whitehall that burnt this section down. But this is Wren's house up here. This whole, almost everything in the circle there, that is where he's living um, and the building that I have been um, describing to you. And this was how all the great office holders at court uh, lived. Office and home were one, just like 10 Downing Street um, or the White House in Washington today. So if this is the case, uh, what do we actually know about his interactions with the court and indeed the king? Well, there are two sources of information that can help us get right into the daily life of this extremely busy and fashionable man. The first is the diary of Robert Hook, a brilliant scientist and natural philosopher and the curator of experiments for the Royal Society. His interest moved into surveying and architecture, and he had an intimate association with Wren for some 50 years. From 1672 to 1680, and then from 1688 to 93, he kept a notebook recording his daily movements, his thoughts, his impressions, and this captures Wren's life in great detail. Hook was with Wren several times a week, and just going through the diary, I can tell you, he met him 75 times in 1674, 70 times in 1675, and 80 times in 1676. Now, it's quite a read, this diary. I have to tell you, if none of you have come across it before. It's quite odd, because Hook was quite odd, I think. He was obsessed with his poor health and his bodily functions. On the 1st of August, 1675, I'll just give you an example, he writes of taking volatile spirit of wormwood, which made me very sick and disturbed me all the night and purged me in the morning. Drank small beer and spirit of sal ammoniac. I purged five or six times very easily on Sunday morning. I hope this will dissolve some of that vicious slime that hath so tormented me in my stomach and guts. And it goes on like this sort of every, every day. But of course, crucially, uh, he lived in Gresham College. That's where he lived. He lived in Gresham College. And I hope that his ill health wasn't a result of that. Um, and of course, in those uh, happy, far-off days, uh, professors were given a residence in the city of London, and he regularly attended lectures, including one lecture on Thursday, June the 17th, 1680, when he recorded in his diary, attended morning lecture. None came. Not one. Luckily, that hasn't been my experience, but there's always that risk. Nevertheless, we hear of Hook turning up at Wren's house in Scotland Yard uh, and dining with him, uh, dining with other major court figures, with politicians, with foreign dignitaries, and sometimes with other uh, people from the Office of Works. Presumably, the great dining room that we re read about was for larger parties, uh, and the many accounts that Hook gives of intimate dinners took place in the small dining room upstairs. Lady Wren was there sometimes, um, and uh, I get the impression that uh, uh, perhaps not as, uh, as often as she might have liked, uh, because it was quite a sort of boys' club. Hook meets Wren in coffee houses and taverns and at Gresham College, of course, as well as at council meetings of the Royal Society and on numerous building sites in the city churches and St. Paul's Cathedral. But all the time, there is the magnetic draw of Whitehall, where their shared professional responsibilities for the city churches and St. Paul's Cathedral required them to audit accounts and approve payments to contractors in uh, Wren's uh, lodgings. This is a marvelous source of information for Wren's life, 
comprising many hundreds of entries recording his movements, who he saw, what he was working on, what he liked to eat, and what he liked to drink. The other key source is much more empirical. The surveyor was entitled to claim travel and subsistence if he left London. Travelling around the city was covered by an allowance of four shillings a day in his annual remuneration. But when he left London, he was able to claim an additional four shillings and ten pence a day. This was claimed each month in arrears, and all these travel claims survive. And they tell us not where he was going, but the fact that he was going. And this allows us to do some clever stuff. Triangulating the diary and the expenses, you can begin to paint an interesting picture. And I'll give you an example. So, as usual, throughout June and July 1679, Hook and Wren were meeting at least once a week, often two, three, or even four times. But suddenly, after meeting Wren in a city coffee house on the 1st of August, Hook doesn't see him again until the 30th of August at St. Paul's Cathedral, an unnaturally long gap of a whole month. If we turn to the Office of Works rising charges for August, we see that after many months of inactivity and no uh, claims for expenses at all, he charges for two days riding expenses most likely one for the way out and one for the way back. But how do we work out where he went? Well, in 1679, the king's rebuilding of the royal lodgings at Windsor Castle was completed. And the whole court decamped from Whitehall to Windsor for four weeks of fun, frolics, balls, hunting, card playing, plays, fasting, and feasting, not fasting, uh, feasting and uh, music. Everyone was there, including, it seems, Christopher Wren. This wasn't a professional trip. Hugh May had been the architect for the castle, not Wren. And though I suppose it is possible that architecture was discussed, this month was about being a courtier, not about being an architect. October 1676 is another good example. That month, Wren clocked up 13 days' charges when, for the previous three months, there was nothing, and the following four months, he didn't make a claim either. The explanation is that on the 4th of October, the King, the Queen, and the Duke of York moved with the court to Newmarket, and Wren clearly followed them. Hook's diary explains that he dined with Wren on October the 5th, the day after the court left, but didn't see him again until Wren's birthday dinner on the 20th of October, an absence of over two weeks. In September 1682, after weeks of claiming no travel, the court removed to Winchester, and Wren clocked up six days' riding charges. In 1674, when Charles moved the court to Windsor again, Wren incurred two days' riding charges in each July and August, and Hook notes in his diary that Wren was at court. He came back to London partway through uh, to attend to business, but returned to Windsor, Hook noting on July the 18th that he was finally back in Whitehall. I could go on, but I'm not going to, because this is more than enough to demonstrate that when the court left Whitehall for Windsor, Newmarket, or latterly Winchester, Wren was hot on its heels. We should not imagine that Wren was busy discussing building works during these peregrinations of the court. He was a courtier, and he threw himself into whatever entertainments were on offer. The diarist, John Evelyn, spent the night at Newmarket in October 1671, and you can see on the screen here the surviving pavilion of Newmarket Palace, um, built by Charles II. Um, it's a lovely museum now, well worth visiting. Um, but in October 1671, uh, John Evelyn found, and I quote, the jolly blades racing, 
dancing, feasting and reveling, more resembling a luxurious and abandoned rout than a Christian court. And racing really was not the only entertainment at Newmarket. There was a tennis court, a bowling green, and most important of all, there was a cockpit. And sometimes, while the court was in residence, there were cockfights cock twice a day, and in the evenings, there were plays. So this is the environment in which Wren spent a considerable amount of his time. Now, unfortunately, eyewitness accounts of Wren's more formal interactions with Charles II are much harder to find. We can read in the financial accounts of the Office of Works that he was personally instructed by the king on every major project and many of the minor works that he undertook. Uh, but we do have a couple of descriptions. In early 1683, the lawyer and architectural connoisseur, Roger North, was at a meeting of the treasury in the presence of the king. Wren had been summoned, and the subject was the financing of the new palace at Winchester. The king asked Wren how long it would take to build it, and he told uh, his majesty it would take two years. But Charles thought that this was too long and inquired whether it could be built in one year. Yes, Wren replied, but only with great confusion, charge, and inconvenience. Notwithstanding this warning, Charles made the decision to proceed, and on the 9th of February, the Treasury authorised expenditure of £36,000. A rare glimpse of that conversation between king and architect making a decision. Other references show that the relationship between the two men was not always easy. In some way, we don't know how, it's recorded in Hook's diary, Wren briefly fell out with the king in October 1674. And famously, after the great model uh, for St. Paul's Cathedral, um, Wren's uh, you know, greatest desire to build this uh, particular scheme, after it was rejected by the Royal Commission, uh, the king told Wren, um, ordered Wren to start again uh, on a new design, and uh, he openly burst into tears in the king's uh, presence. These occasions, I suggest, are signs of the intimacy that Charles II and Wren shared, and the access that, that uh, Wren had to the king. And Wren was very jealous of this position, his access on matters scientific and architectural. And this is revealed in an extremely interesting exchange with Robert Hooke. One of Hooke's most uh, intense areas of inventiveness was in clockmaking. And one of his inventions, a magnetic clock, was shown to the king by Richard Busby, a royal ecclesiastical favourite. Charles II, uh, intrigue, intrigued, wanted to meet Hook, and he was summoned to court, where one of the grooms of the bedchamber, Silas Titus, presented Hook to the king, who then, quite uh, uh, extraordinarily, invited Hook into his closet for an intimate examination of a double pendulum sea clock which uh, Hook had brought with him uh, in a box. Leaving the king, Hook, full of excitement at his royal interview, went straight to Scotland Yard to show the clock to Wren and tell him all about his, uh, um, his interview. Wren was stone cold to his friend, telling him that he should never have a room at Whitehall and that if he wanted to meet the king in future, he should do it in St. James's Park. Wren, a hook noted in his diary, seemed very jealous of him. In fact, Wren was so cross that Hook, a socially inferior person and his junior in every way, had gained access to the king, that he then withheld his wages, despite having money about his person. It took three weeks for Wren's irritation to abate, and even then, Hook had to hang around for hours until Wren signed off his bill. Well, the right order of things was re-established in March 1678, 
when Hook was having trouble with his lately deceased brother's will. Uh, Wren, who had this wonderful free access to the king, uh, was asked to raise it with the monarch, and uh, this was done much to the satisfaction of Hook. Uh, in 1680, Hook expressed an interest in seeing the Royal Library at Whitehall. The king uh, was uh, uh, away from the palace, and Wren used his passkey to take Hook into Whitehall and show him the room. So why is all this important? Well, I think it's a very different perspective on a man who's often portrayed as austere, intellectual, and a bit of a workaholic. It, uh, the, the records, I think, show how much he was plugged into fashionable life, following and making fashion. It demonstrates the way architecture at Charles II's court was a joint enterprise between the monarch and Wren, and that um, first and foremost, Wren, to be successful, had to be a courtier, and that was the basis of everything. So this year, as we try and get uh, closer to this man who died 300 years ago, we begin to understand a little bit more about him. Blessed with a pedigree that gave him a deep understanding of the court, the king, its ceremonies and behavior, he shared with Charles II the fascination with science and experimentation and was spotted by him as a vehicle to achieve his architectural ambitions. And so he moved to court, and that was where he spent his life. Unlike so many awkward geniuses, he was engaging, amusing, a great conversationalist, able to navigate the treacherous rapids of court life. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've introduced you to the flesh and blood of this great man, no lonely genius, but a cog in the great muse machine of state, oiled with his own charm and genius. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I rather hope you've all got your traveling expenses hidden away in some secret account. Uh, it's going to be much safer that way, I suspect. Um, one of the things that is hidden away in your talk somehow is the sort of mechanics of his daily life, of how someone was able to contribute to the cosmos, to medicine, to architecture, whilst partying, as far as I can see, traveling from yeah. one place to another. How, what was the infrastructure in which he lived? Well, I think, the, the, as I say, the, the absolute key to it was this house. And what you uh, read in Hook's diary, and he dined with Wren there the whole time, uh, are the other guests around the table. And they are the leading scientists, uh, the, the leading artists and um, uh, architects, um, you know, foreign uh, visitors, ambassadors, um, other court officials. I mean, this is where it all goes on, round the dining table in, in Scotland Yard. And uh, afterwards, he would go out, he'd come to the city, he'd look at a couple of city churches. Uh, he'd then go to one coffee house, which was meet with a whole lot more people, and another coffee house. Um, some days, he'd go to three or four coffee houses, one after the other, um, uh, meeting people, all of whom are listed in, in the diary. And you could have a very, uh, draw a very interesting sort of spidery diagram showing this extraordinary web of connections, which all went back to this um, center of activities in Whitehall, because um, that is where he went to sign, sign, audit the accounts, to supervise the draftsman in his uh, drawing office, and to do a very big administrative job. He's not only doing the administration for all the royal palaces, He's doing it for the city churches and for St. Paul's Cathedral and for the Greenwich Hospital and the Chelsea Hospital and for a library in Cambridge. It's a, it's a huge amount of work, and he, he must have been a, a really extraordinary man to fit it all in. Thank you for a really fascinating lecture, Simon. I wonder if you could say something about Wren's travels on the continent, particularly in France. Yeah, um, well... He, well, he, he certainly went once to the continent. Now, there's a very, very interesting debate about whether he went during the Commonwealth, and I'm not going to get into that now, but I am giving a lecture later on this year 
after some deep delving into, the, into some quite interesting records about whether he went another time. But the, the key time he goes um, is just before he becomes um, surveyor of the works. Um, and I'm pretty certain that he was more or less sent to France by uh, Charles II, who was determined to rebuild Whitehall Palace. Um, he goes with a sheaf of introductions uh, from the then uh, uh, surveyor, um, Sir John Denham, um, and it's a fact-finding mission. He's just about the only uh, uh, person who's active in the architectural sphere who didn't spend most of the, uh, of the Republican period uh, on the continent. And so he was really at a disadvantage, I mean, a huge disadvantage. And I think he recognized that, Charles II recognized that. And um, he went on this extraordinary architectural tour um, and came back with a you know, with crates full of books and prints and drawings. Um, and he um, did his best to meet all the most famous architects uh, and uh, people who were working in France. And so it was, a, it was definitely a formative moment for him. Um, and in fact, um, Hook does give the impression that he, he came back with a French valet um, who um, then lived with him in this house for some years, um, uh, dying in the... Um, in the late 1680s. Uh, what I'd like to know is what his relationship was like with Cromwell before Charles II. Ha. Well, uh, as I said, um, his, his sort of meteoric rise um, and his initial fame all took place during the Republic. And um, many of those people who he had sort of closest connections with, including his key patrons, were very, uh, uh, very knitted in with the Cromwellian court. Um, and in fact, one of his um, inventions, uh, 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 apparently Cromwell himself wanted to, wanted to see. So um, it, it, in a way, it's extraordinary that uh, he was, became so successful and, and in his circle famous during that period, given his background. <laughs> I mean, as, you know, he really could not have, uh, the name Wren, was just like a big, you know, bullseye target which he'd shoot at because you know you, you couldn't be anything other than a, a diehard royalist. And of course, um, when Charles II returned, he was Wren was able to present back to the king the registers of the Order of the Garter on bended knee. They are your Majesty. They were saved by my family. So um, it, it, you know the, his royalist credentials uh, didn't hold him back, and I think. His, his brilliance just carried him through. Wouldn't it be nice if that happened? Yeah. I, I was rather hoping we could have somewhere nice to get together as professors at Gresham College, but uh, yes. many centuries ago. Speaking of brilliance, um, it's, I think, your last scheduled lecture for it Gresham is. College, very sadly. Um, I'm hoping we can persuade you back in the future. But you've been doing it since 2009, Too I long. discovered when I looked back, as professor of the built environment. Um, all the lectures have been erudite, entertaining, enthusiastic, educational, wonderful, and delivered with great charm and elegance. And uh, we'll miss you doing that very much indeed. Um, and as I say, I hope to entice you back again and um, perhaps with a little bribery. Oh, marvellous. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. So, so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking thank you. Simon Kinney. Thank you. Thank you.